Trolita says, under the making a scout hatchet for my daughter, you are not making. You're just restoring or pimping. <laughs> pimping. Pimping. It's like, pimp my ride. Pimp my hatchet. Pimp my hatchet. <laughs> I love uh, I love the gatekeepers when it comes to making people who are like, you're not making it, you're just, you know, restoring it or you're just, you know, reclaiming it. Like, what is making? Making is taking something and making it into something else, right? Putting your own uh, perspective on something. Is a hatchet head by itself a hatchet? Like, is it without the handle? Is that still a hatchet or not? Like, so I okay, so I take the hatchet head and I make a handle and I put them together and does that turn into a hatchet? Like, if I'm making spaghetti for dinner with the pasta and the tomato sauce and I put it together, is that making pasta? Or do I have to make the pasta the spaghetti? Do I have to make the spaghetti? Do I have to grow the tomatoes? Do you say you're making dinner? Or am I just, like, combining ingredients to make food? You know, like, what do you, we call it making because making is what, it's what it is, right? And it sounds better than restoring or refurbishing and... When someone's searching a video on YouTube, they want to, they search how to make this thing, right? How do I, I mean, we've called things rehandling an ax, right? You know, when it's specifically that, but if I'm putting together ingredients to make something new that wasn't there before, then I'm making something. So, but that's, that's the old debate. What is making? Like how far do you have to go before you consider yourself a maker or not? Is it, do you have to make all of the ingredients? Do I have to smelt the steel and then you know, make the, the axe head and make the form and forge it and then put it together. You have to be in the mines. Yeah, right, exactly. You have to mine the material. Do I have to do it all to be a maker? <laughs> I can't just take all the ingredients and put them together? Does the, uh, does you know, the, the cabinet maker, like you're not making a cabinet, you're just putting together pieces <laughs> of wood in a form that creates the cabinet. Like you're Just gluing together pieces of wood. <laughs> If, if I'm putting something together and I'm turning it into something new, I'm making that, and I'm happy to call it making. Hey guys, welcome back to The Art of Craftsmanship. My name's Dustin, and today in the shop, I'll be answering and responding to five of the best comments and questions of the week, and then at the end, I'll show you something fun from the shop that I have, whether that's something that I've done in the past or something that I have for the future. From the Family Not Welcome Questions video, Michael Lyons says, Leon, L-Y-O-N-S? Lyons. Michael Lyons says, Cave trolls, mountain trolls, bridge trolls, internet trolls. Heed them not. Your videos are great. I love that your family is willing and interested in what you do. Keep doing it. We actually got uh, a decent amount of comments on the, the questions videos we put out so far that are telling us to ignore the trolls and don't worry about them and you know don't give them the the limelight you know don't don't talk about them because it's just you know it's shouting them out now we agree 100 percent, right that we Devin and i have always said that you know the comments that are on the videos the troll comments we don't give them you know any attention because that's what they want you know it's all the other people who are there who are watching you guys who are watching who who want to interact and want to have a good conversation and give good comments that we should be putting our efforts into commenting back to you guys and i we agree 100 percent that being said, the, uh, the trolley comments that we refer to in the videos are uh, fun ones that we think will make a good conversation piece, right? It's a, it's a fun way to start the video, and it's a different aspect, and it gives us something a little bit different than just a questions video. So we like to start them off with doing a troll comment, talking about that, addressing that information, and, and you know, it's, it's a comment that isn't so negative that it, it's not really hurting anyone. Um, there are lots of comments or there are occasionally comments that are really negative and we usually just delete those comments. So um, the ones that we're talking about in these videos are just fun comments that we think are interesting enough to address and talk about and we think will make good content and we'll do a little bit something different than just doing a video with just five questions. So yes, we agree and thank you to all those people who have responded to us letting us know that they don't care about the trolls and that we're doing great stuff. We really appreciate that. But those troll comments are kind of fun to address at some point. From how to pick and hang a store-bought axe handle, Celtic Barbarian says, I feel like he's effing with me, hitting the bottom of the axe handle to seat the head. After you shape the top of the handle to fit the eye of the axe and you kind of fit it on and off a bunch of times, then when you're doing your final seating, 
you get it kind of set on and then you flip it over and you hit the bottom of the handle and it actually forces the handle into the eye more so the mass of the head sit it, it holds still when you hit here so this is actually you're forcing it down onto it instead of trying to hammer from above you know trying to get that whole mass to move straight down you have to hammer here or here you can't actually do that so you flip the handle over and you hammer on the back or the bottom of the handle and it forces the handle down into the eye further and further so so no i'm not I'm not effing with anybody when I'm showing that. That's definitely the way you do it. It's the, the most efficient way to uh, really seat the handle really well down into the eye of the axe. You, do, you flip it over top, hammer the bottom, and it'll push that handle down further and further and really wedge it nice and tight into your axe head. From making a hidden tang file knife with antler handle, Han UK says... Got a tip that will help you in the future. When you quench your blades, you need to move them around vigorously to prevent the light and frost effect. It will help your blades harden more consistently. Just a tip from another smith. All right, what's that? N U K? Han U K. Han U K. Kusanagi. <laughs> that's why I didn't. That's why yeah, I didn't right. want to say it. Oh, that's fine. Uh, another. I was gonna say he's a, from another smith. So. Uh, what he's talking about is uh, when you quench a knife in the video, I, um, I quenched the knife after heat treating it in my bucket forge. I quenched it in oil, I think canola oil, which is still what I use. And when you quench your blades, you're putting them, taking them from hot, from non-magnetic um, austenite, and you're quenching it and it converts the steel to martensite. So it makes it super hard and that's what hardens a blade. That's what makes it, that, that's what gives you the ability to sharpen a knife and it keeps an edge because it's hard. Um, what he's talking about is when you quench the knife, you need to move it around inside the, inside the, the, the quenchant, whatever that is, because of the Leiden frost effect. The Leiden frost effect is when you put a blade into oil, a hot blade, it's basically heating up all the oil around it. So if you put it in and you leave it still, all the oil around it becomes hot and it's no longer quenching at a high rate because it's surrounded by warm oil or warm quenching. So the Leiden frost effect is that creating a vapor jacket, a hot vapor jacket around it. It's bubbling, it's creating a hot air around it. So you need to move it around so it's moving into new cool oil. Um, I think it's fun and funny when people comment on old videos that I made years ago um, on new techniques that I have done multiple times in new videos. But again, it's just a good tip from someone saying that, you know, when you are quenching, you need to make sure you're moving that steel around so that you're not creating a vapor jacket around it that stops it from quenching. So if you put it in, you think that you're quenching your oil, but it's not actually quenching or it's not bringing the, it's the transition between austenite to martensite. It's not happening fast enough to actually harden your blade. In the making a knife from a circular saw blade video, Wayne Hickman asks, what was the blue see-through ruler type thing you used around the 121-127 minute mark in your video called? Uh, Wayne is referencing this tool, which is a French curve. And uh, this is something that I picked up at an art store. This is by Mars, which is just a company that makes drawing tools. This is a French curve. There are, there are all three of these are French curves, just different... Uh, different types of curves. But what this, this tool does is it gives you a bunch of different curves. Uh, so when I'm drawing a curve on a knife, like the belly of a knife or the back or a handle, and I want to draw a nice smooth curve and I just don't want to do it by hand, then I can use the French curve. And depending on where I am on the blade, I can choose a tight curve or a really shallow curve. Um, same thing with this. You know, This gives me a, a long arc curve or a really tight curve on the inside. So depending on where you are on your knife, what type of curve you want, the French curve gives you a full variety of different types of curves to draw. So it's purely just a tool used to, um, to draw lots of different types of curves. So there it is, French curve. Brian Hazelhurst asks, many thanks for your vice advice. I'm just wondering why so many are mounted on the left side of the bench. Mine is mounted at the right hand corner of the bench and has a swivel base like yours, which makes it quite versatile. He's talking about my vice here being on the left side of my bench as opposed to the right side. Um, 
when I'm facing it. So it's opposite for you guys, but I don't really know. Uh, so I will talk about my own preference. Um, the vice is on this side of the bench because my chop saw is on the other side of the bench. So I have these kind of two main active places on the bench. The chop saw is over here only because that's originally where I had the most access to power strip. So that went there and the vice one on the other side. Um, I have power on the other side now as well. So I have like my grinder, uh, angle grinder and Dremel set up over here. Also, I think maybe actively having my right hand over the bench and my left hand over the vice. I'm right-handed, which makes sense for that. So again, I can really only talk about why mine is on this side, um, but definitely having kind of things in my right hand that I can reach from the bench, use my left hand to put something in the vise or not. Um, you know, I think that makes sense because I'm right-handed. Also, I have more room around my vise over here, so I can kind of get to the back side and I can move on uh, three sides of it, which is one of the reasons I have it set off the, the bench a little bit um, so I can actually move around it and then I can put things vertically. So for me, it's just a practical spot. It's the, it makes the most sense in my shop. If I had a different setup in my shop, it might be on the other side. So I don't know, I guess maybe um, if you think about why practically it would be on that side and why more people have theirs on the left as opposed to the right, maybe it's because more people are right-handed than left-handed and that kind of makes sense to have your right, your dominant hand over the bench, um, picking up the things that are on your bench. I don't know. It's a good. It's a good. Uh, it's a good mind teaser, I guess. All right. Well, here's my show and tell for today. It's a golf ball. Now, the nice thing about this golf ball is that I drilled a hole in it, and I put in a a nut that is just a, a large nut. The nice thing about this, though, is that with that nut in it, with a threaded nut. I can actually use that and thread it on to the end of a file. Now this is a big farrier's rasp that I have that I use for uh, for bow making. Having that on there as a handle gives me a really nice grip on the end of this file, um, so I can use it um, as a file. But if you know, instead of having a wooden handle, and I have lots of different wood handles for files, this is a really good way to give yourself a really nice positive grasp onto the end of the file, depending on how you're using it. Now again, I was using this one in a really kind of aggressive way, so I wanted to give myself a really nice positive grasp. And I forget where I saw this trick, but it's really easy, maybe about three quarters of an inch down, just smaller than the nut that I wanted to use, and I just pressed fit that into there, and it works really well. The threads on the nut work really well just to grab the tang of the file. Locks on. It's a show and tell, a little bit of a shop hack. Um, use a golf ball to give yourself a handle at the end of a file. All right, guys, thank you for watching. Remember, if you wanna have your questions answered in future videos, you can always leave us a comment down below and we'll kind of pick through them and pick out really good comments and questions that we think will work well in those future videos. But also, if you head over to patreon.com and become a member there, you have access to our Discord and you can ask us all sorts of questions and we'll absolutely put them into future questions videos. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure you don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you in the next video.